Uh, I'd like to thank the Asia Society for uh, co-hosting this with the Hunter College Department of Political Science, where I work. And after this moment, I'm going to hand off to our speakers directly, because I know that's what we want to hear about. I'll just flag very quickly that we're doing a lot tonight uh, in one session. We're going to talk about what happened in this election, why it happened, and what it all means. And when we say what it all means, we mean for the future of Indian democracy and institutions and very specific things like whether there will be amendments to the Indian Constitution. Uh, we're also looking at things like policy changes that might take place, uh, as well as things such as whether Indian foreign policy or its engagement with the world will change. So with that, I'm going to hand off immediately uh, to Milan Vaishnav to give us a kind of overview of the, the what happened, some of the data, uh, and, and uh, sort of set the stage so that we can get further into why it happened and what's significant about it. Great. I think maybe I stand up if that's okay. Um, uh, thank you, Rob, and thank you, Tom. Thank you, Age Society, for having me. Um, I have the unenviable task of trying to summarize what happened in this election in six to eight minutes, so I'm going to get right to it. I think there's slides. I don't know if they're, there we go, they're on. Um, I'm the boring guy with the slides, but I thought in this case it might actually be helpful to give you a visual sense of what happened in this election. Um, so as many of you know, this was a landmark uh, election uh, that the BJP won handily with 303 seats out of a parliament of 543. The National Democratic Alliance, which is the BJP alliance, won 353 seats, which was even better than its performance in, in 2014 when the BJP alliance won 336 seats. Um, just to give you a sense, I don't know how visible this is going to be for those in the back of the room, but you know these are maps of the electoral outcome in the last three election cycles, 09, 2014, and 2019, and the saffron bits are the BJP, the blue bits are the Congress, and the gray are all other parties. Back in 2009, 10 years ago, uh, many of us thought the BJP had frankly plateaued. Many within the party thought that they had kind of hit a ceiling uh, and they couldn't go any further. Uh, and they had just come on the backs of two successive election defeats at the hands of the Congress party. Fast forward 10 years and the BJP has won two consecutive single party majorities. It's the first time that's been done since 1980 and 1984 when the Congress party did it. Um, and so they have quite literally remade the political map uh, of India. As you could see, the saffron really take over in 2014 and 2019. Now, from this distance, the 2014-2019 maps probably look pretty similar, but there's some interesting dynamics under the hood. Um, in 2014, 75% of the BJP's tally came from just eight states. These are states from its traditional core areas of western, northern, and central India. Those are the, the areas that are shaded orange here. In 2019, that share went slightly down, but 66% is, is still pretty considerable when you, when you imagine or when you consider the fact that in India there is something known as the incumbency disadvantage. So unlike the United States, incumbents are actually less likely to win re-election uh, as, as they are uh, get defeated. Um, but the BJP actually held a lot of its ground in states like Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Gujarat. These are states that it virtually swept in 2014. Uh, and you could see here, although its seat tally came down a little bit, uh, still a very impressive showing. Uh, but what's really interesting is how the BJP made inroads into the East, right? So the BJP has traditionally been seen as a party of Hindi-speaking Northerners who were at odds with the kind of regional parties which dominate India's eastern corridor. So what I'm showing you here is just a section of that, that larger map just focused on the eastern corridor, starting in Bengal in the north and going all the way down to Tamil Nadu in the south. Uh, these are states, by and large, which are dominated by regional parties who mobilize on the basis of cultural, linguistic, subnational identity. Uh, just to put this in perspective, the picture on the left, the BJP in the states of West Bengal and Odisha won just three seats. Uh, and this time they won uh, eight times as many, 26 seats in just these two states alone. In the southern state of Telangana, uh, the BJP won four seats, which is something almost no election uh, analysts had predicted uh, before the polls began. When you step back and you look at the vote share, uh, these are the all India vote shares for the Congress, uh, the BJP, and the teal color at the top is regional parties. 
For the past six election cycles, there's been a consistent pattern, which is 50% of the vote goes to the BJP and the Congress put together, and the other 50% goes to regional parties. Uh, what has changed in, in 2014 is that the, the BJP did really well and the Congress sank, but that 50-50 split roughly stayed equal. Two things to note here. One is, of course, how well the, the BJP did. It got 37.5% percentage uh, percent of the vote on its own. The Congress essentially stayed still. The regional parties have declined uh, from almost 50% to, to 42%. Now, when you look at where the decline is coming from in this election, it's quite interesting. So there are two types of regional parties. There are regional parties who are called regional because basically their catchment area is a very geographically circumscribed uh, zone of a state or even a sub-region as part of a state. And then there are regionalist parties. So these are the parties that I'd mentioned before that rule along that eastern corridor, which are parties that mobilize on the basis of a subnational cultural identity. Uh, this shows you how the BJP fared in 2014 and 2019 against the Congress party, regional parties, and regionalist parties. So against the Congress, they've essentially run the tables, right? Last time and this time virtually swept every seat where the BJP and the Congress were head-to-head -head competition. They did basically the same against regional parties. So these are, think of caste-based parties like the SP or the BSP or the RJD in the state of Bihar, uh, where the gains have really come this time is in the BJP strike rate against these regionalist parties, right? So a lot of these gains which have come in the Eastern Corridor are against these regionalist parties. Now, how did this all happen? I think, you know, Kunshin is going to get more into the very uh, interesting and important issues of caste and religion. I just want to focus on leadership. Uh, the Modi factor, as we like to call it. This shows you here the net favorability of Narendra Modi over Rahul Gandhi beginning in April and May of 2014 to April and May of 2019. And what you could see here is that uh, Modi has maintained consistently an 18 to 20 percentage point advantage over Rahul Gandhi. Now, there have been some peaks in valley, uh, the valleys. In May 2017, on the back of the BJP sweep of Uttar Pradesh in the state election, Modi was at his apex, his numbers came down. But what's important to note is that his favorability rating is roughly the same as it was in May 2014, which is pretty remarkable given everything that's happened in the five years for the prime minister's rating essentially to be intact. One of the most interesting statistics to come out of the uh, election surveys we've seen is a number from CSDS. CSDS is the only social science research organization which does election polling. And what they found is that 32% of BJP voters would have voted for another party were Narendra Modi not the BJP's prime ministerial candidate. So in some ways, Modi is polling way ahead of even where his, his party is uh, in this election. Now, a lot of people said, well, what about the economy, right? The Indian economy isn't firing on all four cylinders. We have agrarian distress. We have rural wage stagnation. We have big problems of joblessness. Growth has been, you know, solid but not particularly stellar. What's interesting is that the economic issues actually became less important as this campaign dragged on. In part, I would argue, because the Modi leadership factor really trumped everything else. That paradoxically, people may have been, may have developed economic grievances over the past five years, but saw Narendra Modi as the answer to those grievances. So to the question, what is the most important issue to you uh, as you vote in these elections, 21% of respondents said jobs and joblessness the month before the election that percentage actually declined by 10 percentage points during the six weeks of the campaign to just uh, 12 percent at the end of the election. Uh, Thunbi will probably talk more about tensions between India and Pakistan, but undoubtedly, in my view, the events of, at Pulwama, the attack that took place on Indian forces on Valentine's Day, and the response uh, uh, of the Indian uh, government to launch strikes against uh, terrorist training camps in Balakot did provide a bump because it spoke to the attributes that Modi often touts about himself. Muscular nationalism, leadership, decisiveness, right? These are all things 
which he has built a kind of mythical um, uh, uh, kind of you know reverence around. And it became the filter through which a lot of other issues uh, have been seen. So people who were aware of what happened when India responded to Pakistan were much more likely to downplay the relevance of the economy in their voting decision. It doesn't necessarily mean people are voting for national security, but it started to color the way that people saw other issues. Let me just end here, because I don't want to go on for too long, stepping back and talking about a a meta or structural issue, which is in 2014, a lot of political scientists had a debate about whether we were entering a new era in Indian party politics. In the quarter century between 1989 and 2014, no single party really served as the gravitational center, the gravitational force of Indian politics. You had a multipolar system. Neither the Congress nor the BJP was frankly strong enough. In 2014, we finally saw the first single party majority in three decades. This here is a chart of what political scientists like to call the effective number of parties. So you take political parties and how they perform and you weigh them by giving more weight to those who win more seats because a party that wins one seat and a party that wins 30 seats obviously aren't the same. And what it shows you here is that the effective number of parties at the national level is essentially three. Right? Even though 37 parties won uh, uh, at least one seat to parliament, um, the nature of political consolidation we're seeing now is something that we haven't seen for several decades in terms of the level of party competition. Margins of victory, so the difference between the winner, the vote share the winner gets, and the vote share the runner up gets, was declining consistently for 20 or 30 years. It's actually crept back up now. Elections are becoming less competitive. Uh, than they were uh, just a few years ago. And this is not because of voter apathy. Uh, As Tom rightly mentioned, we have seen the highest turnout that we've ever seen post-independence in these elections, about 67.4%, so about a one percentage point increase over what we saw in 2014. And I think one of the most interesting dimensions about this, and this is where I'll end, is that for the first time, male and female turnout have reached parity, right? This has never happened before. There has always been a pretty sizable gap between the propensity of women to come out to vote and the propensity of males to come out to vote. That has essentially become an indistinguishable difference. Now, there is, of course, the caveat that women are uh, more likely not to figure on voter rolls, so there is a registration gap. But if you're registered, women are coming out at equal rates as men. And I think I would point to that as, as one of the big hallmarks of this election when we step back and look at it in whole. Let me just end there and, and turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. It's really helpful, Milan. Thank you for setting the stage for us. I'd like to just follow up and allow the panel to sort of talk to you about this. But I have one question to start you off, which is some people have been saying following this th- election that more or less we're seeing the end of the Congress party, at least in large parts of India. And the statistic that's cited is when Congress goes below 20% of the vote in any of India's states, it never recovers. It is unable to resuscitate itself. And there's a number of states in which this has happened. So, of course, you can't see the future, but are there good reasons to think that the space formerly occupied by Congress will now be occupied by other forces uh, that going forward? Or is that sort of the speculation that has no real grounds in it? It's a question to me. For, for yeah. everyone, but since, you know... You've <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer, as always, is it depends. Mm-hmm. Now, it's true that when the Congress falls to third place or lower in a state, mm-hmm. either in the assembly elections at the state level or in the national elections, it, it never recovers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's been true now for several decades if you look at historical election data. Uh, There are two things going in the Congress's favor despite two successive poll debacles. Number one is, despite everything, they still get one in five votes in an Indian general election, right? That 20 percent vote share seems to be a floor. Now, the bad news for the Congress is it may also be the ceiling, but that's, that's, that's another issue. The second issue, Rob, is that there are enough states in the Indian Union that are still two-party states which feature bipolar competition between the Congress and the BJP. Mm -hmm. So states like Gujarat, states like Madhya Pradesh, states like Rajasthan, states like Uttarakhand, Himantra Pradesh, and others, Chhattisgarh, where until and unless there's a third-party force that really rises to the occasion, if there is a reservoir of anti-incumbency, the Congress is the only party right now that's placed to really take advantage of that. So um, I think that's perhaps the silver lining in the, in, the, in the Congress defeat for them. 
Right. Before turning to Kanchan Chandra, who I think will talk to us about issues relating to Hindu nationalism as it relates to governance and the elections, are there any panelist questions for Milan? What he had to say? Elaborations? I mean, I think one of the things is it also depends on what the Congress does now in these um, in these next few years, because you know if one of the convincing cases that people argue that the BJP made is kind of, you know, the uh, successfully made what they call the Tina argument. There is no alternative. And the question is, can you now see a Congress that says, okay, there is an alternative, not just in terms of leadership, but in terms of policies delivering. And they have these states where they can actually show what their kind of delivery alternatives, et cetera, could be. Uh, you know, central governments sometimes will make their lives uh, difficult just so that they can't prove it. But the onus is on them to show, to some extent, uh, you know, what what are they going to offer um, as well. So I do think it depends on on that as well. That's, I'm sorry. And I think, and I, you know, uh, globally, if you think of this idea of founding movement parties, mm. so political parties that, you know, in this revolutionary phase, found a nation, mm. build a constitution, create values, um, you do see a decline. Mm. So if you were to think about, you know, uh, the ANC, for instance. But what seems to matter is is that in the succession battle intra the mm -hmm. party, do you come up with an, a, a next generation, mm -hmm. if you will, not in terms of age, but an, you know, a, a different set of, of leaders mm -hmm. who can sort of reinvigorate mm -hmm. uh, the party. So uh, you, you see that with the ANC mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in, in South Africa. You didn't see that with the Muslim League mm -hmm. um, post-partition. So Founding kind of movement parties that craft constitutions have this huge advantage of having participated in the revolution before, mm -hmm. but also have these constituents who remember what it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the Congress, you know, through this kind of reparative constitution, has attracted new constituents, mm -hmm. um, caste based constituents, gender constituents, yeah. who you know, have partaken of this bowl of constitutional values, mm -hmm. equality, dignity, non-discrimination, reservation. And so the question is, if you have, and as you know in India right now, there is a likely to be a succession overhaul mm -hmm. in the Congress party. So the question is, will this next leadership mm -hmm. be able to fall back um, uh, on those advantages? Very interesting question, not least because in a number of states in North India in late 2018, the Congress party did win state elections, and rather than put up the younger generation into leadership posts, they went with old, right. tried and tested figures who possibly didn't deliver in this general election for their states and their party, as we might have hoped. I don't know what it, whether it would have made a difference, but symbolically it didn't yeah. look like they were handing over to the next generation, yeah. it looks like they were handing back to the previous generation. Um, uh, Just one final quick point on that is that we're in an interesting moment right now because the Central Working Committee of the Congress has met and there's a, there's a script that happens where <laughs> Rahul Gandhi submits his resignation, it's duly noted and rejected, but he has rejected their rejection of his resignation, which means he has apparently, according to press reports, said, I want another nominee for party president who doesn't have Gandhi in the last name. Now, whether he'll be talked out of it in the coming days remains to be seen, but I think already that's kind of an interesting development, no. uh, and we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. I right. think one more, one more thing to add to that is uh, the Congress may have not have done as, I mean, certainly it was not effective competition for the BJP, mm. but it actually held its vote constant, 19.5% mm -hmm. mm. right. in this election, mm -hmm. exactly the same as the last election. Right. So it's very important that the gain for the BJP came <coughs> from the regional parties and not Congress. Mm -hmm. It also yeah. increased its number of seats. I think it's not so much that the Congress has lost support, but it's a change in the nature of that support. I mean, if you look, look at the map that Milan showed you, Congress, essentially was a peripheral party. And by that, I, not, I don't mean that it, it lost support, but that it was pushed to the borders, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. south and parts of the east. And so sort of the mainland has been taken over by the BJP. And the second thing, and I'm going to spend some time talking about that, I think it's not so much the death of the Congress in terms of vote share, but certainly a very major ideological death. Mm -hmm. I think the, B, the Congress has not been able to defend the ideas which it is associated with. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that changing in the next few years, barring a major 
organizational restructuring of the party, not just the leadership, but the grassroots. And I don't see any likelihood of that happening. And part of those ideas are the nature of nationalism right. and what it means. And I, I think that's, that's more right. or less what you'd like to talk that's about right. now. So if you'd like to just move right sure. on to your remarks, you can stay seated, go up as I'll you like. Uh, this is a, a good moment to hear about that. Uh, uh, after Kanchan speaks, we're going to have some more discussion, uh, and then we'll hear about uh, issues of human rights specifically around constitutional amendments and what might happen in this coming parliament from Annika, and then we'll move on to foreign policy, all kinds of policy issues with Tanvi. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, I want to thank the Asia Society and Sanjeev and Tom and Rob for organizing this event, and all of you for coming on a very rainy day. I'm really looking forward uh, to the discussion. Um, I want to speak about this, uh, what I see as the significance of this uh, election result. I think what, this is a fundamental election. I think the really, the most fundamental election I've seen in years, and I've been following elections now for almost 30 years. And I think its significance lies in the fact, I think really what we are witnessing is the birth of a Hindu nation. Um, and by birth, I want to say not that this is a fait accompli, certainly not that this is a completed process. If we just look at the vote share for the BJP, 37.5%, India's Hindu majority is 80%. And we haven't, I haven't seen uh, the uh, survey data on the percentage of Hindus who voted for the BJP. But even if we assume that every BJP vote came from a Hindu, it's still clear that half the Hindus in India are not voting for the BJP. It's just, you know, 37.5%. So it's not a project that is completed by any means. Mm -hmm. But by the birth of a Hindu nation, I mean to say two things. One is you see uh, more, more broad-based, greater support uh, behind the idea of the BJP, not just as a party, but behind the idea of a Hindu nation uh, than before. And I also mean a change in the nature of the debate. For a long time, the nature of the debate in India was whether the Hindu majority should have any special ownership rights in India. And I think that threshold has now been crossed. I think the debate now is over what that relationship might be. Uh, and I want to sort of say a little bit about the campaign. And, you know, we've spoken a lot about, or you read a lot in the newspapers on, about Modi, about the BJP, about what Modi said. Milan focused on that too, the importance of Modi. Uh, to this election campaign. And I'll say a bit about that, but I also want to focus on um, the opposition and not what the opposition said, but what the opposition did not say. And there, particularly on the Congress uh, party. Um, and so here, if we think about when India was created in 1947, it was not as the Hindu mirror of Pakistan. By that I mean India, Pakistan was created as a homeland for Muslims within British India. But India was not created as the mirror image of that idea. India was not a homeland for the Hindus of British India. India was created as a state that belonged, as a nation that belonged to all its inhabitants, whether defined by religion or otherwise, and whether they belonged to the Hindu majority or otherwise. And I sort of take that as a very broad definition of the idea of a secular nation, whereas the idea that India belongs particularly to its Hindu majority is something I see as sort of the, the, the crux of the idea of a Hindu nation. 80% of the Indian population is Hindu, and 94% of the world's Hindus live in India. But those Hindus have never been associated with any particular um, ownership rights. Um, so now, in the five years preceding the election in 2019, uh, we already saw the BJP government move very much towards, um, towards giving Hindus a special place within sort of the ownership of the nation. And I just, you know, you've, you would have heard of a lot of this before, so I'll just list some of these changes. So, for instance, the BJP introduced a citizenship law which would privilege Hindus but also other religious minorities. It's, the citizenship law essentially discriminates against Muslims in the allocation of citizen, citizenship. And that bill will lapse when this parliament, you know, when this parliament uh, does, but the BJP has promised to reintroduce it in the next session. Uh, the BJP has uh, promised also to reintroduce a bill on Muslim personal law and sort of what is known as triple talaq, divorce law, uh, as it's sort of framing it as an issue of gender equality, but of course it also affects the autonomy of, um, of uh, the autonomy associated with, with Muslim personal law. In India, the BJP government has changed the names of streets and cities and roads associated with Mughal emperors in India, not all Muslims, but Mughal emperors, with the idea that the history of Mughal rule in India is not necessarily a history of which we should be proud or commemorate. 
Um, it is appointed, it appointed a Hindu religious leader, uh, Chief Minister of India's largest state. It's the first time that you've had a religious leader head a government in India. Um, and the list goes on. The targeting of Muslims by vigilante groups, um, the, an, an effort to reconvert uh, Muslims to Hinduism, all of this sort of tacitly sanctioned by the government. So this is the history that precedes the 2019 election campaign. The interesting thing about the 2019 election campaign, if you follow the speeches of Modi, and if you read the uh, manifesto of the BJP, the word Hindu is absent altogether. So the term Hindu does not appear in the 2019 manifesto of the BJP, whereas it has certainly appeared in its previous manifestos and in its mobilization campaign. And the reason the term Hindu does not appear is because I think in this particular campaign, the BJP and Prime Minister Modi in particular were very successful at taking the notion of the Hindu majority or ideas of Hindu values and fusing them with the nation altogether. And so the BJP then spoke about national culture, national symbols, national values. And the association of those na values with Hinduism was essentially sort of so clear as not to require uh, reiteration. And so when the BJP spoke in its manifesto about enshrining India's or encouraging, deepening, um, recognizing India's cultural heritage, the symbols it spoke about when it spoke about India's cultural heritage were really all Hindu, the Ganges River, the Ram Temple, which it promised to reconstruct. Um, and, I, you know, I, 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 um, I think you, this, so this has been covered enough, so I won't go into, into much more detail on the BJP campaign. The one thing I also want to highlight is another word that did not come up in the BJP manifesto, and that was unemployment. Uh, and these two things are, are quite closely related. The BJP appeal uh, to the Hindu, to its Hindu majority is very, very broad based. Uh, if you know, if you look at exit polls, it's across age groups, across social classes, across caste groups, people who are both on the winning side and the losing side of uh, the economic reforms of India's new economy. And the appeal to cultural pride, to Hindu nationalism, is in a way a diversion, a distraction from the, from the uh, essentially from the great joblessness in the Indian economy. And as fact, as Milan showed you that slide, the jobs became less salient as the campaign wore on. But when I say diversion or distraction, I don't mean that necessarily in a pejorative way. Um, there is something about the BJP campaign that taps this notion of cultural pride, this desire for cultural authenticity. And there's something about Modi who personifies that desire for cultural pride and authenticity. And I think that is a desire worth taking very seriously if we want to understand what is happening in Indian democracy today. I think the debate over the Hindu majority, the BJP, Hindu nationalism and the parties or sort of the, you know, the, the opposing point of view, that has become so polarized now that we end up assessing or sort of worrying about the normative implications of that idea as well we should, but without really understanding it. And I think there's sort of such a, the support for Modi uh, from such a broad-based section of the population really requires explanation that goes beyond, you know, there's one way of looking at it to say, this is a deplorable idea. Look at what is happening to, to India's minorities. Look at what it means for tolerance and dissent in the Indian state. And that's all true. But these are deplorable ideas, but we cannot dismiss those who support these ideas as deplorable too. I think it's important to actually understand where that support comes from. And I sort of have some sort of some suggestions, but I think that is a question that remains unanswered answered in much of the writing on India. And that to me is the million dollar question. But now, do I have two more minutes? Sure. So, okay. So here, I've sort of, you know, I promised you that I would focus particularly on what the opposition and what the Congress did not say. And again, you know, if you think about the one word that was missing from the Congress manifesto in this election, it was secularism. It doesn't show up anywhere. Mm. And this is quite remarkable because the idea of secular nationalism, the idea of India as a secular country, which belonged to everyone as a secular nation, that was very much a Congress idea. That was an idea associated with Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister. That was an idea that entered the constitution because of the advocacy of the Congress party. And of course, the word secular was put into the Indian constitution much later by the Indira Gandhi government in 1976. But the idea that the Indian nation did not belong to Hindus in particular, that was part of um, essentially what you could say is the Congress legacy. Uh, and so it's quite remarkable that the Congress party chose not to defend that legacy. And by that, I, I don't mean just that the word was missing in the manifesto, but actually I just returned from India yesterday. I've been following the campaign. Um, and to just give you some examples, um, the Congress, um, so both Rahul Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi 
very much adopted sort of most of the constituencies they visited, including sort of Rahul Gandhi and the new constituency he went to, uh, he fought from Wayanad, were photographed, were very much sort of, uh, 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 it was very important for them to be shown participating in Hindu religious rituals. The Congress made a big deal of these rituals. It was on billboards, on their election campaign, emphasizing that Congress leaders, in particular their main leaders, were religious too. Congress Muslim leaders, including someone as senior as Ghulam Nabi Azad, went on record complaining that they were no longer asked to campaign for the Congress the way in which they used to be. They were sort of, in a way, sort of treated as invisible. Uh, Priyanka Gandhi was in charge of Eastern UP, which is very much sort of a state associated with communal polarization, but with a large Muslim population. Uh, her road shows always usually, usually started and ended at a temple. They didn't really stop, at least not, not that I could see, nothing that I saw reported. They didn't stop at mosques. There were no Muslim leaders who accompanied uh, the Congress on its, uh, the, the main campaigners on, on, on their campaigns. Uh, Uttar Pradesh, this is the state associated with the largest number of lynchings, associated with car protection, the largest, a lot of targeting of Muslims. The Congress said not a word, at least not in the speeches that I heard, and nothing in its manifesto on these questions. It sort of promised to address the question of hate crimes without really talking about, about Muslims in particular. And so this was a remarkable silence. This was a silence also that we saw in, I would say, most opposition parties. So one of the things, uh, you know, I attended uh, in UP particularly, uh, the uh, SP and the BSP, these were parties seen as, as, as very important in, in, in defending, or in the past they've seen very, been seen as very important in defending the rights of minorities, in particular Muslims. One of the rallies I attended, the main candidate of the SP-BSP coalition was an ex-BJP candidate. He'd been denied a nomination by the BJP, so he switched over to the SP and the BSP. Uh, the BSP symbol is an elephant. This is a party, you know, this is a party that mobilizes uh, Dalits, India's Dalits caste that were once treated as untouchable. Uh, it has, um, you know, it's mostly been silent on the question of religion. The BSP does not oppose Hinduism. You know, the, the, the precursors of the BSP actively took a stance against Hinduism as, 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 um, as being oppressive towards Dalits. The BSP has not taken an explicit stance, sort of been silent. But, but now at this particular rally, um, as the BSP said nothing on secularism, the BSP again said nothing on lynchings, on the violence, and the BSP's elephant also had a, had a swastik on it, sort of a Hindu religious symbol. This is not new, it sort of pops up from time to time, but it popped up particularly in this election campaign. SP supporters at that rally were waving the SP flag, but also had scarves around their head that said Jai Shri Ram, sort of, you know, to the uh, recognition of the Hindu deity Ram. And so what you see here is really, I think, an abdication of the ideological battle for secularism, particularly on part of the opposition. You know, one of the, uh, the state of West Bengal, there you actually had, that was an interesting fight where you might have seen the idea of secularism emerge. This is one of the areas in the east, Milan showed you in the slide, the state of West Bengal, where the BJP expanded quite rapidly. I mean, it won 18 out of 42 seats, a sort of a, a never before in a way, accomplishment in the east. And here there are two things that happened. The regional party, Mamta Banerjee's party, the Trinamool Congress, which is one of a handful of regional parties that actually managed to do somewhat. I mean, she lost ground to the, BJ to the BJP, but, but did better than most other regional parties. Banerjee defended the idea of secularism in her election campaign, but very much from within a Hindu interpretation. So she sort of spoke about secularism as being very much a Hindu idea, sort of contesting the BJP's interpretation of, of Hinduism when she tried to defend secularism. But it wasn't sort of a d defense of the secular nationalism that existed outside the values of the religious majority. And the left, which one, which has always been associated with the defense of secularism in India, many people from the CPM, from the left actually joined the BJP. And so when we speak about, you know, and here with the left, when it comes to the sort of, you know, has the Congress died? I don't think Congress has died in terms of vote share, but the left really has died in this particular <laughs> election, I think both in terms of vote share and in terms of sort of the ideological defense of that idea. So I'm almost at the end, you know, I'm going to stop. There was an, an op-ed by Amartya Sen in the New York Times a couple of days ago and then also in the Indian Express today, where he said we must distinguish between the battle for power and the battle for ideas. And he said the BJP has won the battle for power but it hasn't really won the battle for ideas because ideas were not really discussed. There wasn't much discussion about these ideas in the election campaign. And I read that very much as a defeat, as a defeat for a battle of ideas. Essentially, this is a case where the reason you see the birth of a Hindu nation 
in India is both because of what the BJP has said and done and because of what Modi personifies, but also what the opposition has not said and done. Uh, and this is essentially um, the opposition conceded um, the debate without fighting it. And so the fact that there wasn't this fight seems to me in a way a deeper signal of the in a way of the, of the, of the concession for the idea. So to, to me, I read this both as a defeat in, when it comes to power, but also as an ideological defeat. Stop here. Thank you, Kansha. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask the panelists if they have uh, sort of reflections on what Kansha had to say. I'll just add one thing, which is to say we had a small lunch in the fall with one of the key people writing the Congress manifesto here in New York, organized at the New School, and a couple of people at the uh, table who are far more knowledgeable than me and really in politics, tried to suggest the idea that maybe reclaiming the idea of secular nationalism could be part of the Congress manifesto. And that was immediately dismissed out of hand. And they decided they were going to focus their campaign around corruption and the abuse of power by uh, the prime minister. And they were going to find a, a specific case and they were going to drive it home. And I think some people around the table felt, well, you know, this isn't going to go very well for Congress because, you know, your party is still pretty closely associated with the corruption from last time you were thrown out of office. It might be too soon, uh, but it was clear that the manifesto was going to go in a certain direction. And uh, more than just the manifesto, the, the party organization, if you compare it to the BJP, and I don't know if anyone wants to talk about that, is, is hugely different. I mean, the BJP, I think, has raised 98% of the funding under this new campaign finance mechanism called electoral bonds. Its organization is on the ground everywhere, uh, organizing, uh, doing the last mile between messaging, f f coming from the top all the way down to voters. Is, is that really part of the problem here? It's not so much that Congress couldn't formulate a message. Is that the organization, the money, the mobilizers, that's all with the BJP now. So I'm just wondering if you, any reflections anyone has on that. Can say something of that? I think that's very much the case, I mean, in, in two ways. So one is, you know, so the Congress did not really formulate an ideological defense mm -hmm. of secularism. There were the elements of a different idea. I mean, it, it did adopt a, a Hindu majoritarian position, but both Rahul Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi tried to distinguish it from the, B, from the BJP by talking about the politics of love as opposed to hate. Mm -hmm. And they spoke about a nationalism based on love and truth as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, it's almost, I mean, sort of a Buddhist idea, you know, Rahul Gandhi spoke about compassion. It really, it wasn't developed, it was sort of, it was glimpses, it wasn't really developed into an alternative. Mm -hmm. But had it been, there were no workers to really right. take it to people. I mean, there was essentially no grassroots functioning. And I think there are two things, multiple things with the BJP organization. One is you really do have this very well organized grassroots organization that is meeting all the time. And it's not just a matter of ideological dissemination. You know, the BJP slogans were decided months ahead of time mm -hmm. at their national executive meeting. The Congress was still scrambling sort of day, you know, a few days ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, you also have a real turnover in the faces of the BJP. I mean, there really is, it's sort of a combination of intra-party elections, but then sort of a centralized turnover of the old guard. Mm -hmm. And so you see with every election, including this one, a whole, a large number of new names. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you think both about Modi and Amit Shah, the prime minister and the president of the party, you know, 15 years ago, they were not, they were sort of not particularly well known within the party. Mm -hmm. And you see the BJP is organizationally capable of continually rejuvenating itself, mm -hmm. whereas that is not true of Congress. Well, no, I think, I think, sorry, go ahead. I was no, just going to say, right one of way. the things, you know, we, we, we've, there's been a lot of talk about kind of the message. Uh, and I think, you kind know, of the thing about math, organization, uh, money, etc., haven't got as much, and I think this will kind of unravel over time. But I think the other thing is, and it's something, even in kind of 2014, you heard the Modi campaign talk about uh, kind of how they were, how much they looked to American campaigns, mm -hmm. not just in terms of presidential system or information technology, micro-targeting. Mm -hmm. I would say go look at the BJP manifesto. Mm -hmm. They're kind of two or three, two and a half pages on women and mm -hmm. promises to women. Um, they're kind of on the agricultural side. Today, one of the things I kind of discovered rereading the manifesto was that they had pro they're promising to do a kind of national beekeeping and honey initiative. I mean, you know, it seems amusing, but I think, you know, just in terms of targeting particular voters, making sure, you know, people have, so you might not have a job, but if you ask the question uh, that we ask here, which is, are you better off five years from five years ago, people might say, well, you know, 
uh, it's not great, but I have, you know, a bank account and, yeah. you know, a toilet and a, you know, some other kind of program that's helping me. And I think one of the things, and I don't know, Milan, if there's already data, is while we say it's these larger messages, the question is, did Indian voters just decide, given the alternatives, mm -hmm. that Modi was best placed to deliver these things mm -hmm. compared to, because he's actually on the economic and social side adopted, he's outflanked yeah, the sure. Congress on the left. Do they just think, listen, these guys had a, a convincing, you know, he made the argument, G you gave me five years, you gave them 65, give me another five. Did that manage to convince them that mm -hmm. he is best placed to deliver these things uh, rather than kind of just focusing on the, the top line message. I think these other things are quite important to look at at the granular level as well. A lot of the reporting brings both of those things together, the organization and the delivery on schemes, because reporting in a number of newspapers found that even when you were in, would interview someone and say, did you benefit from one of these schemes? Did you receive this benefit? Their answer was no, but I will soon enough. And part of the reason why is there was a very targeted campaign of local party workers from BJP having their photos taken with beneficiaries of schemes and that information being conveyed to the local area so that people could see, oh, someone in the next village, someone in the next town got this thing, I'm next in line. It's very sophisticated, very effective. There's some real material benefit behind it, but there's a kind of leveraging towards what, you know, this idea of prospective voting. In other words, we're not judging the government on what they did up to now, but what we think they're going to do in the next five years, and that pays off very well. Monica, I think yeah. you had some thoughts. So I, I was very struck with the, the first speech that Amit Shah gave after the BJP mm -hmm. Uh, Amit Shah is one of the party uh, leaders, uh, is, is works from... Uh, the president of the BJP. President. Um, is, you know, he says many things, and then he very prominently extends his thanks to the Panna Pramukh. Um, Panna being electoral role, mm -hmm. Pramukh being the person who's been given a part of that role. Mm -hmm. And what does this mean that, you know, the Panna Pramukh <coughs> would get out based on the electoral role, um, you know, seven to eight families. Right. Right. Um, that is the kind of micro organizing. Mm. No, at, at, at one level, we can have this conversation about the battle of ideas, mm. right? And at another level, you know, and I'm sure all of us have, if you travel through UP, if you travel through MP, Bihar, I mean, there are parts mm. that no political party is reaching, mm. but the Panna Pramukh is getting to these families. Mm -hmm. And the Panna Pramukh is saying, I can't tell you who to vote for, but I'll take you to the, the polls. I'll take you to the booth. You know, and it is that kind of, this is not even last mile connectivity. Mm. This is the last few hundred meters connectivity. Yeah, and I think when we talk about the battle of ideas, if you don't have this kind of last few hundred meter connectivity, mm -hmm. how will you get your idea out there? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, at, at one level, elections are about organizational machineries. Mm. Um, and of course, at the other level, it is about seeding constitutional values. Yeah. But it seems to me that the BJP has shown that these elections are about functionaries like the Panna Pramukh. Mm -hmm. Melan, you had something uh, Just uh, quickly, I mean, I think, <clears throat> just to elaborate on Kunshan's point, the ideological quandary that the Congress faces has two dimensions. One dimension is this question of secularism. I think there's a growing idea in India that the Nehruvian construct of secularism has been wholly discredited. Because unlike in the United States where there was a strict church-state separation, the Indian constitution essentially adopts a principle that the state maintains an equal embrace of and an equal distance from all religious faiths. Now over time, there have been many secular politicians who have opportunistically used secularism to pander to particular rel religious communities as a vote bank. Uh, and uh, so the BJP has been able to say uh, secularism is coterminous with minority appeasement. Uh, and so as a result, the Congress uh, made a strategic decision not to campaign on secularism because they felt that that brand had been tainted, but rather to say we want to distinguish between Hinduism and Hindutva, between Hinduism, which is a plural, very open, diverse, tolerant religion, and Hindutva, which we see as a radical uh, manifestation. Now that clearly didn't cut ice, I think, uh, with a lot of voters. But that's the quandary that they're in, is if they want to go back to secularism, can it be of the same Nehruvian sort, or do they have to construct an alternative edifice? The second is on welfare, which we've just talked about. I think uh, 
what's so been so interesting about the BJP is they've essentially saturated the political space. So that traditional center-left pro-welfare approach with the Congress have been associated with has been built upon by the BJP. So they have invested hugely in the public provision of private goods. So things like gas cylinders, uh, electricity connections, uh, toilets, which were spoken about before. The Congress has no answer to that other than to say, well, we'll do those things bigger and better. Because many of those, those ideas were the Congresses initially, and Modi is kind of throwing them back in their face. So both when it comes to welfare and when it comes to this question of the, the boundaries between religion and politics, I think, frankly, I don't envy their position because they seem to be rather struck on both dimensions. Right. Another thing that's striking, I don't know if people thought about the BJP manifesto, was were there new promises about development and the economy that were different from before? To me, it looked very much like we're going to keep doing the same thing, and though we didn't deliver last time, who are you going to trust but us? And I thought that was very striking because usually there's a shift of frame onto a, a new set of issues. That might have been true in the campaign, but not in the manifesto, or were there things that stood out as different? You know, I spent a fair amount of time both with both manifestos and with following mm -hmm. both parties around and the one area on which there was a difference is the BJP manifesto said very little about jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of incidentally, you know, so mm -hmm. it never, so job creation is not a central component. Mm -hmm. They talk about jobs indirectly in right. a couple of other things. The Congress makes jobs, puts jobs front and center. Mm -hmm. But on every other dimension, infrastructure, technology, housing, redistribution, mm -hmm. there is this simplification of the tax structure, mm -hmm. they're about the same. I mean, the BJP says a little more about, about simplifying tax structures for the middle class. Mm -hmm. And the BJP had this interesting shift where the Congress for a long time, actually not just the Congress, under successive governments, you would highlight, you would identify certain districts as backward districts mm -hmm. and earmark special development expenditure for them. Mm -hmm. The BJP doesn't talk about backward districts, it talks about aspirational districts. Mm -hmm. you know? So, but these were really differences in degree. I think when it came to the economic platform, mm -hmm. as you said, I mean, the two were so close together. Right. And so the main distinction between the BJP and the other parties has always been on the question of, of, of Hinduism and nationalism. Right. And in this election, that sort of closed as well. But I wonder, uh, I'm sorry, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by, by this issue of jobs, right? Um, because uh, roughly a, a million young Indians join the job market every month, right? Um, so that is huge. Mm -hmm. um, uh, manufacturing jobs are contracting in India, just like anywhere else in the world, including in America. Um, so, you know, can you sort of, can you pull off one election mm -hmm. or even two elections mm -hmm. on a brand, on a man, um, when, when does that stop being effective? Mm. And, and I think the issue of jobs, I mean, we will soon hit a point of this becoming a pandemic mm -hmm. uh, because we don't have enough jobs. And we have aspirational young people who are coming into our cities with expectations. Mm. Um, and I think the flaw, I think a major flaw in terms of the Congress's strategy was even their slogan. Mm. Chokidar uh, Chor, which is mm -hmm. casting aspersion on the Prime Minister. Now, whether you like the Prime Minister or not, mm -hmm. I think yeah. that slogan fell flat. Mm -hmm. um, so I think. Calling him a thief. Yeah, so I, I, I think the issue is that if you want to highlight, um, you know, an alternative, if mm -hmm. you want to point out to voids in a manifesto, then you need to do it. Right. Um, I think for most people, the slogan, the issue of corruption, especially when you are you have these allegations yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that just fell flat. But, but my sort of next layer to this is that when, do, when does Hinduism and Hindutva start mattering less than jobs? Mm -hmm. Well, that moves us from manifestos and commitments that are explicitly made to those that perhaps are implicit or in the BJP and Hindu nationalist movement's plans around constitutional but change. I know that you're talking about that. Let me just say one more thing sure. yeah. on jobs, yeah. which is, yeah. you know, joblessness was not a problem specific to this campaign. Yeah. Joblessness is an old, old problem. Of course, what, you know, what's changed now is economic growth and aspirations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have a very, very high level of, of unemployment, including disguised unemployment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this has been going on since at least the 80s. 
And the effect that it has on the Indian political system has already happened and is happening, hmm. which is extremely high levels of violence. So not insurgencies, but mm -hmm. also violence as an everyday fact of life, mm -hmm. social violence, civil violence, the use of violence by every political party in election campaigns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and jobs have never been a major issue in, in any single parliamentary election campaign. Mm -hmm. And so what I see them as doing, I mean, you know, whether the BJP talks about Hindu nationalism or other parties, redistribution is also a response to joblessness. Mm -hmm. I see the effect of so many things in India, the dysfunctions become routinized. And I think the effect of a million people entering the job market every, mo every, every month and not getting jobs, I think the effect of that is going to be an increase in the level of chronic violence. Mm -hmm. But I think, it, it, sure. I, don't, you know, I think this could go on for a very long time. I don't see elections being won and lost on the question of joblessness. Right. Uh, it was very much an explicit promise that all these jobs would be created. Yeah. And it was expected that when they weren't delivered, there would be a backlash, and yet there hasn't been. So I think political scientists have to think about that relationship more closely. But would you sure. like to talk about yes. constitutional change yes. and what might be on the horizon with respect to uh, India's constitution, well, uh, amendments well, or otherwise? Well, hopefully nothing. Right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I sort of... Um, I think this is as good a time as, as any other um, to read, um, you know, just, just my favorite bit of the Constitution, um, uh, just because it seems right, um, uh, especially after these elections. Um, so the, the preamble of the Indian Constitution um, says this, quote, uh, we the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly, this 26th day of November 1949, to hereby adopt an act and give to ourselves um, this constitution, right, unquote. Um, so, you know, we've had a conversation on democracy, right? But India is not just a democracy. Um, it is a constitutional democracy, uh, a samvidhanik loktantra, right? So we can speculate uh, about the victors and the losers in the loktantra, mm -hmm. but what is not up for discussion is um, the core values uh, of the constitutional democracy that is India. Why has this not been up for discussion thus far is because you've generally had parliamentary strengths and weaknesses being broadly, evenly divided up. Mm -hmm. What is interesting about this election is that finally you have a political party in its second term back, so this is not the first term in, but in its second term back, coming back with an extraordinary number of seats, both in parliament, but also in the state legislatures, right? Why is this important? The Indian constitutional democracy uh, and the constitution that was adopted, as Kanchan rightly pointed out, chose in 1949, between 1946 to 49, when the constitution was being drafted, to explicitly be something very specific. We would not be a Hindu nation. That's one part. But we would also be something more, right? And the preamble talks about it. We will be this country built on fraternity, built on equality of opportunity, but most importantly, built on equality, non-discrimination, and a value for life. Now, you would argue that what we have seen over the last five years is a severe compromising of those values. But what is more disconcerting is that given the numbers that Milan has spoken about, numbers both in parliament, in both houses, because the numbers in the upper house and the Rajya Sabha will also soon change, and the numbers that are emerging in the state legislatures, it means that the constitutional text provides that you can amend textual provisions of the Constitution if you have a two-third majority, so two-third of 540. But you can amend core areas of the Constitution. What is a core area? Fundamental rights, equality, dignity, non-discrimination, secularism. If you have two-thirds 
of both houses and half the state legislatures. Now, what is the protection against a muscular party doing that? Right? What is the protection against a muscular party gutting this constitution? The protection is the Supreme Court. Basic structure. That basic structure will not be amended. Mm -hmm. Why does this come up? It comes up the last time we, we faced this kind of muscular political party. This is Gandhi's time, the emergency. The court comes up with basic structure. What is basic structure? Well, what is the core? What is the soul of India? And the soul of India is, according to the court, judicial independence, secularism, equality, non-discrimination, expression, um, and this charming idea that every Indian is equal in terms of dignity, right? That you do not, you do not prefer one set of Indians to another, right? That is the core idea. So today, to my mind, right, um, I greatly learned from conversations on why the BJP has won, right? Um, and I am very interested, I think, in the democratic nature that is the Indian electorate. But I think what I'm concerned about is the state of this constitution. And we have seen this very, in, 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 we've seen this play out even in the elections. Article 324 of the Constitution of India provides for the Election Commission. The Election Commission is tasked with superintendence, direction, control of preparation of the electoral rolls. But there is something else that the Election Commission does. If there is any reason, and political theorists have written about this, if there is a core reason why the Indian democratic project in terms of elections works, it is because you have an independent and neutral election commission. There has been cause for concern in these elections. When you set up a customary pattern of an election commission being compromised, you devalue the core belief in the electoral system. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you weaken the project that is constitutional democracy. That's the second thing. The third thing is when you have electoral disputes, constitutional democracy works if you choose not to settle those disputes on the street, but you choose to go to court and you contest an election under the Representation of Peoples Act. This only happens if you have faith in your court. And this only happens if you have faith in your election commission. Now, as we've seen electoral challenges being mounted in high courts uh, and in the Supreme Court, the response of the election commission has been, well, somewhat lacking. So I think I want to end with this. My causes of concern today as a lawyer and as a citizen is simply this. And as someone who believes in the idea of the constitutional democracy that is India, and who particularly likes the preamble just the way it is, right, is that one, we are worried that the institutions that should be supporting the constitutional democratic project, like the election commission, are under stress and strain. But two, when you have this kind of success of one party, Whichever party that is, let's call it X, Y, Z. When X, Y, Z can control two thirds of parliament with its allies and may control at some point half of state legislatures, then you have a cause for constitutional concern. And I'll just stop at that. Thank you. Uh, and it wouldn't be just the election commission, but other institutions. There's been concern about undermining autonomy, Reserve Bank of India, the Right to Information Commissioner's Office, uh, and others besides that. So I think this cautionary note is uh, very much uh, on point. Uh, I'm sorry that we haven't left a huge amount of time for uh, Tanvi to tell us about external affairs, uh, whether this election signifies the likelihood of a changed approach either to any of the bilateral relations India is involved with, or its support for, you know, liberal internationalism, um, uh, dare I say it, uh, but, uh, but also really just whether or not there will be political incentives for this government, given the mandate it's got, and according to the polls, people vote for the Modi government in, in, to some degree because of their belief that uh, Modi has projected a strong India and has increased India's respect in the world, and I wonder whether that creates any incentive to demonstrate that through all kinds of means that may or may not be advisable. Uh, so I'm going to sit here and do my remarks so I keep it short and we get to question and answers. I mean, usually, and no one's heard me say this before, you know, as foreign policy types, we kind of, the election campaign, you sit back, you wait for the results to come out, then everybody wants to know what's going to happen. But you essentially kind of have about five, six weeks 
we take a little bit of a breather. Uh, this election campaign uh, was not like that. Um, and you really saw kind of foreign and security policy pretty front and center. Um, and I, I mean, I, I said this before, this was not a national security election. It was a national security rhetoric election mm -hmm. because we didn't see debates about defense spending, about what policy approach to the world India should take in terms of trade uh, or capacity issues. That would have told me it was a national security election. <laughs> or police reform, because we often forget internal security is actually, I think, in some ways a bigger challenge often for India, though it's somewhat more controllable uh, than what happens outside India's borders. And in two ways, I think, foreign policy featured, or foreign and security policy more broadly featured in this campaign. I mean, one was this idea, and I think what the India-Pakistan crisis did, it, is a, it allowed the reinforcement of a message uh, of Modi as a strong leader, uh, this idea of a chokidar, a guardian or a watchman, um, who is, and this fed into kind of both the hope and fear sides, um, taking kind of uh, the Indian uh, Air Force strike, for example, after the terrorist attack uh, in India. On the hope side, it said, look, uh, this guy and this party can protect you. Um, on the fear side, it was saying kind of the après moi le deluge, which is, if not me, then who? on the other side. So it kind of reinforced that idea of there is no alternative. Um, I'm your best bet. The second thing got less notice, but it was something uh, that I've seen kind of since the 2014 campaign, uh, where there were four or five things that were listed on the Modi website then that he promised. And people kind of focus on the good governance, the jobs, those things. The, th uh, the fourth thing was respect on the world stage. And you saw this reinforced again and again and again during this campaign, where if you noticed even the many interviews that Modi gave, um, and uh, you know, a lot of them focused on foreign policy. There was one interview that was entirely on foreign policy. This doesn't happen in Indian uh, campaigns. And you saw this kind of reinforcing this message that, look, India now has respect on the world stage. I mean, forget the fact that Manmohan Singh was actually fairly well respected. But it does kind of feed into this idea. And what mm -hmm. they pointed to is, look, uh, things like at the UN Security Council, getting China to finally kind of uh, designate a Pakistan-based terrorist. Look, this is now a new sign of kind of Indian uh, clout. Um, and, and kind of the anti-satellite test that India did. Again, pointing to kind of even beyond this India-Pakistan thing, India has arrived, feeding into that aspirational idea that Indians have that, listen, it's, we focus a lot on rising nationalism in China. This kind of idea of kind of an old civilization that not just in cultural terms, but is taking this rightful place in the world that has been denied to it for all sorts of reasons, it's very much kind of present uh, in India as well, and I think particularly amongst young uh, people. I think uh, we will continue to see foreign policy uh, play a fairly big role, not just because of this kind of respect on the world stage or campaign promises, uh, but because uh, kind of India's inter external engagements are fundamental and fundamentally important to kind of delivering on Modi's uh, um, promises and any Indian government's promises of socioeconomic transformation. Uh, the foreign policy is not a choice for Indian governments. It is a, it is a question of necessity. Um, so I do think where we will see, I think we'll see a lot of consistency. The problems remain the same on, in terms of India's, also the opportunities in terms of India's neighborhood, and I would say extended neighborhood all the way from what they call West Asia or the Middle East uh, to East and Southeast Asia. Um, whether you look at kind of the Pakistan issue, and I'm not going into details, happy to answer them in questions. Um, but also kind of in terms of the big two, the U.S. and China relationships, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, but I will say, I mean, the international environment that uh, Prime Minister Modi is facing is very different from the one he faced in 2014. Uh, the question is, what does he do with it? Um, you know, in some ways, it looks like a whole bunch of challenges. U.S.-China trade war, oil prices that are almost double what they were uh, in 2014. And uh, he kind of benefited from that for many years. Um, a very uncertain kind of what is the U.S. going to do, uh, a, a widening capabilities gap with China uh, and coming out of a crisis with Pakistan that could have gone very differently had it been handled or escalated in a way that uh, the countries might not have wanted to do, uh, but that could have happened. And so the question is, how does Modi and his government kind of tackle these? Some of these things can be opportunities for India. The China-U.S. trade war. India can say, look, 
-hmm. come produce here, come, we're also a services hub, we're the only country that can not just uh, provide kind of uh, potential export potential, but a domestic market of the size that uh, China could. Uh, but that requires kind of certain decisions on things like uh, trade, thinking about uh, uh, how do you actually make sure that you don't run away from the opening uh, that has benefited uh, India, that took kind of more Indians out of poverty uh, than having a closed, relatively closed economy. But how do you make sure the benefits are distributed across? Um, but I think there are also key questions in terms of India's ability to do things with the U.S., China, its neighborhood, um, on things like defense spending, building indigenous capability uh, on the defense side, on the uh, uh, internal security side, um, on the intelligence side, on the diplomatic side as well. Um, just very briefly on China and the U.S., there's some big questions that are going to come up. Again, not different. So I, I don't think these are different questions, but they come up again and again, uh, which is do you see that China relationship with India is primarily and going to continue to be competitive? Because there are certain things that, were that would be needed for a more accommodative, a cooperative relationship that are or a fundamentally different relationship that are very hard for both sides to do. Um, now, one thing, the constitutional kind of element, uh, this is often forgotten. For a boundary settlement, mm. uh, any Indian government has to take that to, uh, to parliament. It requires a constitutional amendment. Mm. Um, it was hard enough to do some uh, uh, kind of a land boundary agreement with Bangladesh. Uh, the existential idea of doing a boundary settlement with China uh, will take something. That could, for example, help ease some uh, tensions. Today, the China-India competition is not just about the boundary, though it's about China-Pakistan relationship. It's about China, kind of China building ports uh, around India. It's about all sorts of things. Um, but the question, I think, more immediately is, over the last year, we've seen a resetting of tone, a moderation uh, from both China and India. Modi went out of his way while kind of uh, beating the drum on Pakistan, went out of his way to not do that. Uh, on, on China, because it is the big guy that you don't mess with in a way that you can mess with the, kind of the little adversary, so to speak, even though both have nuclear weapons. You did see kind of even him saying uh, something that they were actually using, that, look, China's been blocking the designation of this, uh, uh, of this terrorist at the UN, uh, uh, kind of helping out its ally Pakistan. In interviews, he went out to say, this was not, you know, this is not just China's problem. It's a global terrorism problem. A contrast to 2014, when he went to Arunachal Pradesh, which China claims is South Tibet, and kind of gave this uh, very kind of red meat, which is probably not the best expression, <laughs> uh, speech <laughs> about speech about kind of you know China is has an 18th century expansionist mindset, uh, very different. Um, but this is kind of do they decide to take that resetting of tone, and does China decide? because it has a bigger problem with the U.S., mm. that it needs to kind of ease its India flank and essentially say, we're going to at least for the next year or so ease some of those sensitivities, uh, be more accommodating, kind of be more helpful uh, to India. Um, say to Modi, listen, you need to transform your economy. I can bring in investment in manufacturing, in infrastructure, um, and I can help you also in technology. Hint, hint, uh, don't ban Huawei. Um, this is related to kind of the U.S. question, and I think there are some big questions here. I think uh, the relationship will largely remain positive because the U.S. is just important to India across a swath of issues in a way perhaps no other country is. But there are some key kind of uh, tensions, one of which is defense security. The relationship has actually gone really well in some ways. It's been transformed in the last kind of 15, 20 years, but even in the last two years. But on the trade side, uh, there's some significant differences. Do they close that gap between, you know, the paths going at very different speeds? Um, but there are these questions also about kind of, does the U.S. take a strategic view of India, uh, saying this is important, that Indi India's rise per se is good uh, for the U.S.? Or is it more the kind of uh, Trump transactional view hmm. that, listen, we will support you, uh, but just as he said to uh, allies, uh, but for that, we want um, certain things and certain very concrete things in return. And I think at the end of it, to me, even all this foreign policy stuff, the space India has internationally would very much depend on what happens domestically, economically, socially, culturally. Nobody's going to want to go, you know, engage with a country that is, it's all very well to talk about Indian potential, but if it doesn't perform, if it doesn't deliver, all this kind of becomes a lot uh, uh, very academic, and I think that space that India has kind of internationally uh, will actually get uh, constrained. And as it is, that environment is not great for India right now, but it could be uh, if it makes the right moves.
interesting tensions. I'm sure everyone has questions, but we have to open to our audience. I've failed to get there uh, up till this point. So can we take some questions from the floor? And I think there might be some coming from the internet. Uh, I think we had a hand, uh, the microphone is there. So can you grab someone on the aisle there? I think there's a lady on the aisle this side, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, uh, okay. I was thinking of the woman in the white there. We had her hand up first, I believe, but then the mic can come back to other questions. Sorry um, about that. It's on? Oh, yes. Um, I'm wondering, in the outtake of the election polls, um, was there any assessment of what happened with the Muslim vote in India and how that might have changed state to state? Interesting. Uh, maybe we'll collect a couple of questions. There's one from the... Uh, email from Dhiraj who says, is it possible that doubters of Modi and the BJP may be mistaken of their philosophy, such as a non-Western value approach to development along with non-appeasement based secularism, which touches on a lot of the issues here. Um, in other words, maybe those who are criticizing Modi aren't really getting it even now. Uh, maybe one more question. Who, I'm sorry, the person who had the mic and gave it up there. That would be good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, my question is a little bit about um, the state of journalism and media in India and sure. the role it plays in how ele elections and politics basically plays out. Right. So I maybe we'll just work across this way. Anyone who wants to touch on any aspect of any of those, Milan? Yeah, let me take the question about Muslim voting. So we don't have the data from CSDS, which I mentioned before, is the only kind of social science research organization. What they have shown in the past is that uh, in 2009, uh, the, the BJP got uh, about 35 to 4% of the Muslim vote, right? a pretty insignificant number, as you might expect. In 2014, uh, when Modi was uh, elected to power, that share doubled. Now, it's still low at 8.5%, but you can say that it's increased from a low base. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have the CSDS data. The three exit polls which have made their data publicly available, two of the three show that the Muslim vote is around 9%, so basically roughly the same. For BJP. For the BJP. There is one poll, which is the C voter poll, which shows... Uh, uh, the twenty percent of Muslims have voted for the BJP. Now that's the outlier. We'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about the CSDS data is it's comparable over time, um, but that's what we know thus far from the data which has come forward. And there is variation across states. I believe some of the data on West Bengal showed that the Muslim vote was consolidating behind Mamta Banerjee's TMC even more so than previous elections. That wasn't enough. In fact, that may have been precisely the thing that helped the BJP to expand its base. Uh, in that state. But any other thoughts on this particular question? Or would anyone like to uh, discuss uh, uh, the, the quest other questions that came up? So I'll just say on this kind of question of, uh, because it, 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 it comes up again and again, this idea of kind of non-Western versus best Western kind of ideas. Um, you know, to some extent, and we, you know, you see this discussion in uh, political science and IRs that you know a lot of kind of theories have been developed, and I think that's a that that is a legitimate critique that a lot of theories have been developed uh, based on kind of the European or the Western experience. You're seeing this now uh, in history and political science. People are kind of having to kind of justify how this actually applies to the rest of the world. I always joke that India kind of lives to, uh, uh, you know, destroy all theories. Uh, and it, there's always, you know, you'll have somebody say India is the outlier, and it's like, oh, a little bit of a big outlier. Um, and, I, I, and I think there's no substitute kind of for on the ground um, uh, kind of going and understanding a country. But I, I will push back against this idea um, that anything that is kind of, uh, you know, um, not just kind of non Western or non-Western, but kind of foreign and domestic, uh, because even, for example, the RSS got some of its inspiration from the West, right, uh, in terms of organization. Even the BJP gets Western ideas in terms of how to run elections, how to message. It is using Western platforms like Twitter, like uh, WhatsApp, or Eastern platforms like TikTok, um, which is this Chinese app. Um, so this idea, and kind of India has constantly done better when it adapts ideas from outside. Uh, and adapts it to its kind of domestic uh, circumstances. It makes it its own. I mean, that is the whole point about India. And the reason why does the world, you know, Chinese, 
uh, scholars and officials will often ask us, why doesn't India, uh, kind of the world see India as threatening, India's rise as threatening? Well, one of the big, uh, big reasons is because it's a transparent kind of, you know, a democracy that you can see the sausage making. It is also kind of figured out how to deal with diversity, etc. But I think there's also this idea that India kind of actually critiques this idea that something known as democracy is not kind of Asian, part of Asian values. The fact that the biggest country in the world is part of, the biggest democracy in the world is Asian tells you that it is not just kind of a Western idea. And I do think in the West, we could do better by stop referring it to as, as the Western-led or the Western uh, order, because that actually reinforces some of this. Good point. Others on the panel on any of these points? Can Take a them? quick point on this question about secularism or really understanding what, what Modi is about. I do think that, that every, every sort of political viewpoint in India, certainly the BJP, also adopts and responds, and responds to and incorporates ideas from the West, not just with how to run an election campaign, but also how to define the nature of Hinduism. Hmm. Some of what uh, the notion of Hinduism associated with the BJP or the RSS and what you see happening really across the board is also a kind of evang evangelism, I want to say, sort of a Christianization of Hinduism. You know, so you see sort of, and but again, that, I don't mean that as a critical point. I think it would be very hard to imagine some kind of pristine Hinduism which was pure and untouched mm -hmm. by what was going around outside, you know. I will say, though, that I do think that when it comes to support for Modi or the appeal for Modi, we don't quite get it. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's very important to get it. I mean, you know, so what people say anecdotally, you know, so Modi's association with development, but when they point to the things they believe Modi has done or can do, mm -hmm. they're not that different. So airports, infrastructure, this was also done by the Congress government. But I think what we do need to understand the basis of the appeal of Hindu nationalism and of Modi is more targeted questions. We need sort of ground level ethnographies, but also survey data that we don't have yet. The CSD, the CSDS has been doing this sort of nationalism index mm -hmm. that came out in 2017 and a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So there are some questions there that give you, they still don't tell you why, but they give you a cross tab of attitudes towards nationalism across religious groups. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that there's sort of a, this debate is focused so much on values, and that the focusing on values is very important. Mm -hmm. But as a result, we don't understand enough about the empirics. It has been very interesting after the election to hear some of the opposition uh, <laughs> members of parliament talk about the ways in which they no, have I to try to adapt to this. I think there was another question yes. on, on the, there was a oh, question I'm sorry, on the question media. That came, and then we'll have one last yeah, one. Yeah, so there was a question on the media, I yes. think, which Does which anyone address that uh, media issue? Yeah, I think that, you know, part of this, you know, it, it kind of, sort of comes back to what you were saying, you know, there, were, there wasn't targeted questioning. Um, I mean, we expect the media mm -hmm. and the press uh, to be consistent, mm -hmm. to be objective, um, uh, to be disciplined, mm -hmm. um, and to really speak truth to power. I mean, it's, this is what they're supposed to do. And that's not happening in your view? And, you know, I think it's fair to say uh, that the media has been lax to put it politely, loud but lax, mm -hmm. uh, if you watch any TV show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so lax in questioning, mm -hmm. um, in, in asking hard questions, but also in bringing up issues. <coughs> you know, and this is the whole thing. When does something become an issue on the campaign trail? Mm -hmm. When it's raised consistently also in press rooms. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that your question is about, well, the state of the media. Uh, and it's sort of lacking. Yes, and also I think the onset of the, the digital sphere yeah. and new internet users in India yeah. who are naive about the question of fake news and all of that. Yeah. There's been quite a few recent reports sure. about that. And, and I think there's, there's increasingly been sort of, um, you know, this, this is being highlighted, not the problem of fake news, yeah. uh, the problem of WhatsApp groups, mm -hmm. um, the problem of um, sort of unfiltered, mm -hmm. unedited news accumulation, mm -hmm. uh, which is arguably the digital world that we live in. I mean, we saw that in America and the American elections. Uh, we're, we're going to consistently see that in, you know, electoral cycle after electoral cycle across mm -hmm. jurisdictions. Can I just say, because I think it cuts across on the media and social media, I think the other role the media has played, because it brings them ratings, 
is on this nationalism question. And I think one of the things, and I don't know how data scientists would kind of, or political scientists would disaggregate the Hindu nationalism from kind of that assertive Indian nationalism, arguably, you know, this thing of strong being kind of the, you know, the essentially the neighborhood friendly, maybe not so friendly neighborhood hegemon. You saw this with what happened uh, after the Nepal earthquake, where the Indian media, with its nationalist rhetoric, had nothing to do with Hindus. With, it was kind of chest beating, ended up creating problems for the Indian government's position mm -hmm. uh, with kind of Nepal because they kind of went uh, over the top. And so you do see, I, I think, you know, one of the questions is how do you consolidate all these people who might not care as much, you know, across caste, across region, across language? I Indian nationalism, in not, I don't mean kind of the secular thing, mm -hmm. in the sense of the strong assertion of security, foreign mm -hmm. policy, rightful place in the world, which the media kind of, I think, sometimes disproportionately uh, highlights, which is helpful in politics. But now politicians are also realizing when they're in, in power, it constrains their hand. So any deal, for example, uh, that Modi wants to do with China, it will, it's his own kind of um, uh, the bar that he set, which will make it harder to do. And the media coverage of the airstrikes against Pakistan is a classic example yeah. of where people have questioned what exactly the most of the media was doing, cheerleading rather than finding out the facts. We still don't know yeah. what they are entirely. So there was a gentleman here who was patiently asking, yes, it was you. So I'm sorry, ma'am, but this will have to be the last question. It's a very simple question. What do you attribute this strong showing of the Congress Party in Kerala to, mm -hmm. as opposed to other states? Is the Muslim factor? Oh, just, just that, that's Interesting question. Maybe we'll work this way. Milan, do you want to start with that one and then others can answer that? S so I think it may have been one of the few smart decisions Rahul Gandhi took <laughs> this campaign <laughs> was uh, perhaps seeing the writing on the wall that he was going to lose the, the Congress pocket borough of Amiti in Uttar Pradesh, decided to run from a second seat, which you can do uh, in India from the Vainad constituency in Kerala, which... Uh, by some accounts had really energized the Congress campaign and taking advantage of some anti-incumbency which had set in against the left front government. Mm. And just the general sense that I think the left in India is finding itself somewhat irrelevant uh, in this current era uh, exploited that. And so it was one of the real uh, rare bright spots, I think, of this campaign that the Congress was to do out of the country. And I don't know if you have any other insight into it. Right. Um, you yeah, know, I think fair enough. I think the only the sort of two things that occurred to me is that I think it may be related also again in part to the weakness of the opposition to a decline in mm -hmm. the left to an inability of the CPM to rejuvenate and on that the complications of the Sabrimala issue which the CPM really was not able to navigate successfully. Another part of this question is why the BJP doesn't do well in South yeah. India except for so, Karnataka yeah. and parts and of I, uh, Telangana. You know, I, so I think that overall in the South, with the exception of Karnataka, mm -hmm. um, the BJP has trouble. Uh, I'm South Indian. Um, I don't like the idea of this Hindi-dominated country. Um, <laughs> you know, sort of, I like Hindi as a language, speak it very well. Uh, but I don't think it should be thrust down my throat. And most South Indians feel this way. Uh, so my family comes from Telangana. Uh, and we like Telugu. Perfectly good language. Um, so I think it's very simple, right? I mean, I think this, this kind of hegemonic, monolithic, homogenous Indian speaking Hindi that is being presented, we have trouble with it in the South. Right? I'm a North Indian, and I actually think if, if, if everybody in the, I agree with you, and I think if everybody in the South should, has to speak Hindi, then everybody in the North should learn another language yeah. uh, from another regional language. On that but, note of education, unfortunately, we'll have to draw the proceedings to a close. I'd just like to say we're having a reception afterwards downstairs. You'll be guided there, and I'd like to thank all the panelists in the Asia Society for hosting us, and thank all of you for coming. <laughs>